chapter 1, Numbers chapter 1. And I want to uh, correct. her faithful help over the years. Um, and uh, the, the, the uh, tabernacle also was being moved when the ark wasn't there. So this sort of goes along the line of what we were talking about also with uh, God looking for a permanent place for the ark and the ark representing the Lord himself and finding a habitation, finding a temple, finding a permanent place. And yet, even when they entered the land, it wasn't permanent. They were moving constantly. <clears throat> and so, um, but anyway, we, we really wanted to make sure that uh, it was corrected that um, Shiloh and Gibeon were not the same location, not the same cities, that the ark was actually being moved around. <clears throat> All right. Um, in um, Numbers chapter 1, uh, I want to, I guess if I title this one so you all can write this down, those of you that want to, the place in God's heart for Levi. The place in God's heart for Levi, or the tribe of Levi, however you want to put it, but we'll just call it Levi. And um, I want to start in uh, verse 49, Numbers 1, 49. Only thou shalt not number the tribe of Levi, neither take the sum of them among the children of Israel, but thou shalt appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of testimony and over the vessels thereof and over all the things that belong to it. They shall bear the tabernacle and all the vessels thereof. They shall minister to it, and they shall encamp round about the tabernacle. When the tabernacle setteth forth, the Levites shall take it down. And when the tabernacle is pitched, the Levites shall set it up. And, uh, and the stranger who cometh near shall be put to death. <clears throat> All right. And then let's look at, uh, let's just look at one verse in chapter 3 here. Numbers 3, verse 10. Thou shalt appoint Aaron and his sons. And they shall wait on their priest's office, and the stranger that cometh near shall be put to death. All right. <clears throat> We've actually read two things there. Um, in chapter 1, it was dealing with the Levites. Chapter 3, what we just read, it's dealing with the priests. Now, uh, in our study, we read several scriptures that, that said the Levites, the priests, and Levites were priests and, and that sort of thing, but there were those who were the sons of uh, Aaron who were pri the primary priests. And then the, the, the tribe of Levi, and of course it's called a Levitical priesthood because it's priesthood only in the tribe of Levi. Okay, so there's, there's priests who are Levites and there are, there are workers who are Levites also in the sense that they are of the tribe of Levi. <clears throat> but there is a distinction. Um, <clears throat> And when God initially set everything up, when God finally took control, because consider Abraham going through the, you know, going through the land and doing all this stuff. Consider Isaac, consider Jacob, consider them going down into Egypt and living there for 400 years and finally Moses coming. 
God hadn't really set up anything. They were just sort of believing in God up in heaven somewhere, and they were following God the best they knew how. But when God called them out as his people, he set things up the way that he wanted to. And the coming out of Egypt was a huge step from being individuals who sought the Lord and who just prayed and offered and stuff to a whole system that was completely set up by God and God knew what was in his mind when he set it up. And so when he, he first set up all this stuff, he set up priests and he set up Levites as far as people, as far as people. This was a whole new office, a whole new category, a whole new way of dealing <coughs> with, um, with him through priests and Levites and him dealing with them. And of course, the Ark of the Covenant was the first thing that was built. And uh, it was, you know, uh, it was of primary significance to God's heart. The Ark was the most primary, most important thing to God's heart. <clears throat> um, and from the very establishment of Israel, because really Israel wasn't established not as a nation until they came out of Egypt and came into the wilderness and immediately God began to, to establish these, this Ark of the Covenant and, and uh, the, the tabernacle and this sort of thing. Um, but as, as his, his primary focus, his dedicated focus, once he brought them out, was on the Ark and finding a house for the Ark which was the tabernacle, and eventually getting the ark to Zion and eventually getting a habitation for God that was permanent, a habitation for the ark that was permanent. <clears throat> so, uh, so what we just described is uh, that he wanted his people, you know, functioning toward him, that's priests, and then he wanted... Levites that were primarily dedicated to see into it that God had a habitation. So um, we've just described the two primary offices of what this whole thing was about. So the priest primarily ministered to the Lord, but here's one thing you have to realize. The high priest was, was the main one who did most of the ministry to the Lord, and the high priest represents and is only a picture of Christ himself. Can I get amen? So, I mean, we say, well, I, you know, there are two offices or there are two responsibilities or there are two ways of dealing with this. You're either a priest or a Levite, but the, but the high priest, which represents Christ, is the only one who ministered to the Lord. We would say, I want to minister to the Lord. I want to minister to the Lord. But the high priest was the primary one who ministered to the Lord. <clears throat> but Everyone else, all the Levites, they did one thing. They primarily worked on always giving God a habitation in the earth wherever they went. That was their responsibility. They totally lived towards that end, and that's some of what we want to talk about. Um, and uh, the priests, and particularly, uh, uh, they, there was one priest, uh, I think his Ithamar was was placed over the Levites to make sure everything was done. But the high priest himself, when they got ready to move stuff, he would wrap up, he would wrap up the ark, he would wrap up the golden candlestick, he would do all of that. Um, the high priest himself, which is Jesus, or represented by Jesus. But then it was all given to the Levites, and then the her everything was their responsibility. And that's what we read here. I mean, it's pretty pretty amazing scripture if you actually listen carefully to what we read it says the Levites shall be over the tabernacle the Levites shall be over all the vessels of the tabernacle the Levites will be over all things that belong to it they shall bear the tabernacle they shall encamp round about it the Levites shall take it down and the Levites shall set it up that's basically what we read now one thing you have to remember is these things are shadows the book of Hebrews tells us that these are just pictures upon whom they, it has come to us to be the real, the actual. Does that make sense? 
But that wasn't the real. And so we need to understand this. If nothing else, we need to understand what it was picturing so that we make sure that our lives are patterned after what it is that God had uh, and what he was trying to bring forth here. All right, let's uh, turn back to uh, Numbers chapter 3, and let's go to verse 7 this time. Um, actually, verse 17. <clears throat> Numbers 3, 17. And these were the sons of Levi by their names, Gershom, Koath, and Mary. Now, you can get all wrapped up in this. But these three are the ones that are the fathers over the tribe of Levi. Or, can I say it like this, they are the fathers over the ones responsible for making sure God has a habitation. And their name is representative of different sections of responsibility to make sure God gets a habitation. Now, that's all I'm going to get into uh, there's a, there, you know, we could go real deep into the history of this, but, but we don't want to just go deep into the history of it. We want to, we want to see the Lord. So let's turn to Exodus 38. <clears throat> um, Exodus 38 and verse 21. <clears throat> And this is making the point that I just said, uh, Exodus 38, 21. This is the sum of the tabernacle, even the tabernacle of testimony, as it was counted, according to the commandment of Moses, for the service of the Levites by the hand of Ithamar, son of Aaron, the priest. <clears throat> so there's a priest over this. There are three fathers that represent the fullness of it, the full witness of it. And that some were given the responsibility of the utensils, some were given the responsibility of the curtains, some were given the responsibility of another part. But the whole point is they're all Levites and they all have one purpose and one purpose only to which they live. And that is this habitation thing. <clears throat> so, uh, and, it's, and it's, they're involved in moving Taking it down, setting it up, making sure. So um, now, again, the priests were raised up to minister to the Lord directly. But the Levites and the Levites were chosen. They didn't just happen. They didn't just choose their job. They were chosen to live toward the end that God wanted to have a habitation. They were chosen toward that. And uh, they, you know, they wherever Israel went, wherever the people of God, listen carefully, this is talking about us, wherever the people of God went, the Levites wanted to make sure they didn't just gather and sing. They wanted to make sure they didn't just gather and have a service. They wanted to make sure that God had a habitation. That was their whole purpose for their existence. And that the, it was in their heart that no matter where God's people were, no matter where, God would always be able to have a habitation. Now that's, that's, that's pretty incredible when you consider that. <clears throat> and so uh, as, as the people of God, just the general people of God, moved through the wilderness, to the Levites, it really didn't matter where they moved to. What mattered is when they stopped right here, I don't care where we are, what we're doing, let's get to work to make sure that God has a habitation. And they would carry along the burden of that as they went. When they weren't stopped, when they weren't seeing to it, you know, somebody says, well, why are you always talking about Christ in us? Why are you always talking about... Because that's the responsibility of those who are ministers for the Lord to make sure that whatever else you do, whatever ministry you do in there, you can't do nothing in there unless there is a habitation, unless there is a tabernacle, unless there is, as it were, a temple. And they, these, these Levites would bear, the, and that's, those are the actual, actual words, they would bear the responsibility to make sure that all God's people were understood 
that when we stop, the first and most important thing is, is that God gets his habitation. And, you know, when you, when you think about their whole existence, I'm not talking about a job or a part-time thing. Their whole existence was, as long as we live on this earth, as long as we are here, we make a stand among the people of God that God gets his habitation. <clears throat> well, where did all this come from? We're in Exodus. Uh, flip over a couple of chapters to Exodus 32. And many of you are familiar with this because we've gone through some of this before. <clears throat> but it is when... Uh, in the wilderness before God had even given them the tabernacle. Moses went up into the mount. Remember, he went up there to hear from God, and he was there on behalf of the people to get the Ten Commandments. But while he was there, Israel made a golden calf. You remember the story? Golden calf. And all the people began to worship the golden calf. So, um, <clears throat> let's see. Let's just start at verse uh, 19. And it came to pass as soon as he came near unto the camp that he saw the calf and dancing, and Moses' anger burned. And he cast the tables out of his hands and broke them beneath the mount. And he took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire and ground it to powder and scattered it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. Okay, now let's picture that a little bit. Moses got upset with Israel for getting off from what God had in his heart. So he took their, their thing that they were worshiping. He took the thing that they were worshiping, and he ground it all up, and he scattered it in water, and then he made, it says he made the people get down there and drink it. Sounds like a cult leader to me, but nonetheless. <coughs> um, <coughs> and Moses said unto Aaron, what did... This people, uh, what did this people unto thee that thou hast brought a great sin upon them? And, uh, and Aaron said, Let not the anger of the Lord burn. Thou knowest the people that they are, are set on mischief. For they said unto me, Make us gods which go before us. For as, for, as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of Egypt, uh, we know not what has become of him. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let him break it off. So they gave it to me, and I cast it in the fire, and there came out this, this calf. And I'm sure he just cast it in there, and this calf came out. I'm, oh, wow, did you see that? You know? <clears throat> and when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron made them naked unto their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi, notice these words, And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men, and Moses said, and uh, for Moses, for Moses had said, consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that they may bestow upon, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. <clears throat> so um, Moses came down from the mount, <clears throat> and he saw. We would say he saw them with a golden calf. But he saw how quickly that the people of God had departed from why God had brought them out or why God saved them. I mean, this is, this is not just words. He didn't see a golden calf. He didn't see sin in that sense. He saw, look how they have totally missed why I brought them out, why I saved them how quickly they departed from the exact thing uh, that, that God wanted. <clears throat> and so he began to look for, among the people of God, uh, somebody. He began to look for somebody 
that uh, might retain a spark of desire or uh, have an intention toward God's intention and a recognition somewhat of why God saved you. Why God brought you out. <clears throat> and so that's when Moses said, because he wouldn't have said this if it was simply about the calf. He would have done what he did with the calf and that would be all. But Moses said this, who is on the Lord's side? Who? Is there anybody? Is there anybody really on the Lord's side? Or, and, and I believe he's basically saying, who will live for God's desire? Now remember, Remember, the tribe of Levi said, we'll do it. The tribe of Levi said, we will do it. We will live towards God's desire. We will make a stand in this earth uh, for this. Um, <clears throat> and so, as we know, the tribe of Levi is the only one, the only one who stood up for God and who, uh, um, you know, took his side stood for the interests of God at that time, okay? And, of course, there, these actions that they took in departing from the crowd and taking God's side would really later on ultimately prove to be a very, very significant thing with God. So I want you to consider that in relationship to what we've already shared this was before they were the tribe of Levi, this incident in Exodus 32, in the sense of being Levites, in the sense of being those dedicated to seeing to it that God got his deepest desire for a habitation. All they did at this point was just make a stand for God and his interest and to show a spark toward what God really cared about instead of trying to get God to bless them in what they cared about. Does that make any sense to anyone? And <clears throat> once this incident was passed, once it was over with, um, God would remember Levi's willingness. He would remember how he took his part and how he stood with him and how, uh, uh, how he carried out his des desires despite opposition, despite the crowd, despite, uh, um, you know, the way Every, the, the direction, everything seemed to be flowing. He said they stood for God. And God is later on going to call them to him. And that's when he's going to make them Levites. You will be the ones. You will be the ones. And so look, look over in uh, 2 Corinthians. Because again, this stuff applies to us. That was only a shadow. We're supposed to be the ones who get this. Uh, 2 Corinthians, actually, chapter 8. On verse 11. Paul's talking here to the church, Christians. Now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will so there be a performance also out of that which we have. For if, there first, for if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that which a man hath, and not according to that which he hath not. Notice the, the order of that. Um, Therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will. There is sometimes, a readiness to will, folks, is a desire. But having a desire, as I've said before, is not enough. Uh, I use the example of a girl walking by a store and seeing a beautiful dress there and going, oh, I desire that, I desire that, and then walk on. And just do that day after day and pine away with desire. Oh, I really want, I really want that. I really, really desire that. Oh, oh. Paul's saying, look, as there was first a willingness, a desire to do that, now go do it. Let your will move the desire, or move based on the desire. And so um, uh, God was deeply moved by the willingness of Levi to go against really his own tendencies. And we'll see that later on, maybe not 
today, but in the next time when I finish this off, <clears throat> going against his own natural tendencies. And there was more than a desire in Levi. There was a, folks, there were millions of people there and only a small tribe, one tribe, said, I'm moving past just a desire. I'm going to live. Now, remember David. Remember David. He carried an ephod as if he were a Levite. He was not of the tribe of Levi. He carried it. He, he consulted Urim and Thummim. He acted like a Levite. He lived towards one purpose. He saw the heart of God. Nobody else saw the heart of God. David saw the heart of God. And he said, I will live toward this end. And he spent his whole life working toward that God would get the desire of his heart. Folks, Levi, that's where David saw this. The tribe of Levi, he saw more than a bunch of people and stories and stuff. He saw, my God, these people live towards this end. And then he got captivated by that. He saw it in the word of God and he was moved by it. And, um, and I believe that I believe that long before David, that God looked at Levi, and he looked at the tribe of Levi, and he saw people with whom maybe, possibly, he could open his heart and tell him, I, I had something I wanted to bring forth. I had something I wanted to happen when I brought you out, not just to save you, but to get the ark to a place of permanent residence, a habitation of God through the Spirit, the Bible calls us. And so, uh, and, and I say that because since we're in the New Testament, uh, John uh, chapter 2, uh, Gospel of John chapter 2, you see that this is not just a, a, an easy thing with the Lord. He knows us. John chapter 2 and verse uh, 24. Well, let's see, 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. That, I'm telling you, God is hesitant to entrust just anybody with the deepest desires of his heart. David was a man after God's own heart. David was a man that he loved, that was precious to him, and he opened his heart to him. But folks, he opened his heart to the Levites too. He, God didn't feel comfortable with all of Israel. How quickly they turned, how quickly they got off from his plan, incredibly quickly. But when he put a stake in the ground, the tribe of Levi gathered to it and said, we care about what you care about, not trying to work my way through this wilderness, trying to find out where, where you're heading and what's most important to you. And so um, God has longings and God has desires, and we don't even ask him about them. We don't even care about it. What we care about is that he knows about our desires and our longings and stuff like that. And, and he wishes to communicate with those that would have that, but he doesn't trust most men. He knows what's in all men. That's what it says right here. I mean, it said, and many believed on him, and Jesus said, no, I don't know. Is that what it says? You know why? Because he knows how we are. He knows that we have desires, but we never act on those. Desires. Oh, I really want you. Oh, God, you know, get somebody in a, the right worship service or something, and they'll go, oh, yes, Lord, I really, really want you. He knows that that's been done a million times over and over and over and over. And then people get up and go their own way and then ask God to give them what they want in this life. Give them a habitation. Give me a house, Lord. But they won't be that house. And so, um, you know, he looked at this tribe of Levi, this specific tribe, and he saw a ray of hope. And he saw a basis upon which he might be able, might be able to share his innermost desires and, and heart. And so, um, well, let's go back to Numbers chapter 8. And in Numbers chapter 8, we begin to see this, uh, we begin to see the Lord opening his heart. 
I don't know that you see it by just reading scripture. But I see it. I see that God begins to open his heart to a people, to a specific tribe. And he begins to tell them, and if we just read it with our minds, we're not going to get it. We begin to see that he takes a chance. Verse 20. And Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel did to the Levites according unto all that the Lord commanded Moses concerning the Levites. So did the children of Israel unto them. And the Levites were purified. They washed their clothes. And Aaron offered them as an offering before the Lord. Aaron made an atonement for them to cleanse them, and after that went the Levites in to do their service in the tabernacle of the congregation before Aaron. Aaron is Jesus, the high priest. Aaron is the high priest, and Jesus is the fulfillment of that. And before his sons, as the Lord had commanded Moses concerning the Levites, so did they to them. In other classes and sharings that I've had on this about the habitation of God, we've seen that God's purpose for bringing Israel out, God's purpose for saving you, God's purpose for bringing you out of Egypt was to bring the ark to its resting place, to a permanent resting place within the promised land. And we, we begin to see here in the book of Numbers that God's desire for a habitation couldn't be put off. It couldn't be put off one day in the sweet by and by. I mean, you begin to see this um, from the way that the Lord is immediately moving. This whole thing happened with the golden calf, and then God's immediately, a tabernacle is being set up. Immediately, God's wanting, to, wanting a place and wanting to be with the people and wanting his own dwelling place. And so God initiated this whole thing out of this immediacy, this need, this um, This longing that he had to not wait, even though, the, even though they're not at the promised land. They could have made it in 11 days. It took them 40 years. How long is it going to take you? And so he set up a, a temporary tent. And from this, we, we see that even though it's bad, it's not the way it's supposed to be, God just has this present, immediate thing. It's like a thirst that needs quenching. Goes ahead and sets up this tabernacle. He calls the Levites because he feels he can trust them. He purifies them. Purifies them. And he begins to explain his heart he begins to explain his heart. Let's go back to Numbers, the first chapter, and you can see a little bit of this as he begins to open his heart and begins to put forward some of the things that are there. Numbers uh, 1, let's start at verse 47. But the Levites, after the tribe of their fathers, were not numbered among them, meaning they were not numbered among the children of Israel. For the Lord had spoken unto Moses, saying, Only thou shalt not number the tribe of Levi, and neither take the sum of them among the children of Israel. But, 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 thou shalt appoint 
the Levites over the tabernacle of testimony and over the vessels thereof and over the things that belong to it. They shall bear the tabernacle and all the vessels thereof and they shall minister unto it and, and get this, and shall encamp round about the tabernacle. In order for God to reach this desire that he had for a habitation, the Lord needed to find those who would hold his desire for this habitation as sacred. I mean, listen to that. This was a sacred trust to them. He was looking for someone who would hold this desire that God really wanted a habitation. The church is supposed to be that, the fulfillment of it. Not just Christians, not just believing doctrines, to be indwelt that he can live within us. That it's his life, it's his mind, it's his heart. And to be able to get that, first and foremost, he knew it would never happen unless he had a people who would hold his desire as sacred. And that they would dedicate themselves to seeing that he would get what he wanted. That he would get what he longed for. And you see that in, in Numbers 3 and 4, particularly if, you'll go, if, if you go through there, it just looks boring until you realize what's going on there. God is designing the plan for the Levites to make sure in every detail. They didn't just think up a house. They didn't just go build. They didn't just say God wanted a habitation, God wanted a house, and go build something. Do you understand what I'm saying? They're, they had to find from God. And so when God's explaining this, folks, this is God giving us his heart. Do you see that? Do you see what I'm saying? He could have just said, I want a habitation, and they go out and just build something. But for him to open up like this is to give the very things of his heart to us. And so we see in uh, Numbers uh, 3 and 4, that God put Levi over seeing to it that that habitation was set up on the earth at all times. At all times. Uh, and, so the, and so we see that the tribe of Levi was joined to the Lord in the area of knowing his deepest desires and in the area of knowing his needs and the area of knowing what God wanted. What is the... What does the name Levi mean in Hebrew? Joined. Joined. And they, someone said attached. They were attached to the Lord. They were joined to the Lord. They were like a branch to a vine. They were drinking in of not just God going to a church service and letting the building be the, the habitation, letting the building be the temple. They were that temple. They were becoming that in the real sense of being joined to what it was that he wanted. And you just consider the, the dearness to his heart that they're, beginning to find and, and remember this is this is one of the two highest positions that you could even come to uh, being a priest or being a Levite because as a priest you're you're and a Levite you are directly connected to the Lord and as a Levite you are you, you, your focus is upon him. Your focus is upon what he said. Your focus is upon uh, seeing to it that where God's people are located, no matter where they're located, no matter where on the earth God's people are located, that he would have a habitation from there, that, that, that they would be told, that it would be set up, that they would live to make sure that this thought, God wants a habitation, did not pass away. 
but it would always be brought to the minds of the people of God wherever they, la they landed or were at. And there's no, there's no two higher positions to God. No two higher positions to God. See, we say, well, pastor and teacher and all that. Folks, if you ever search that out, you'll see the, those are temporary callings. They're not going to be forever. Where there is prophecy, it shall pass away. Where there is knowledge, it shall pass away. But folks, the habitation of God will never pass away. We will always be the temple of the Lord. And God's always going to have people that have that spirit. For example, um, Philippians chapter 3. <laughs> Philippians 3 and verse um, 7. This is Paul speaking. But what things were gained to me, those I count lost for Christ... Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. We can read verse 9 too. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Paul is the New Testament fulfillment of a Levite. What things were gained to me? That's a Levite. That's a Levite. What things were important to me before God called me, before I was separated to this task? I count it loss. And Paul spent his whole life teaching and preaching that the church was the fulfillment of everything that was in the Old Testament and that, that God's purpose was to have a temple and that he's supposed to live in us. And that it's supposed to be not I, but Christ living in me. <laughs> Levi would never, never have come to that position unless they'd given up their own personal desires and they'd given up all to see that God gets his desire. Do, do you understand that? Levi could never, God wouldn't have done that. They had to be like Paul. Somebody says, why did Paul get all this knowledge? Why did Paul seem to have such a wonderful relationship? And, and, I, and I go to church, and I sit in the pew, and I don't get anything. <laughs> you know, well, Paul didn't. First of all, I bet you Paul probably never sat in the pew. That's just, that's another subject. But that's, you know, he gave up, he gave up his whole life. Did you, did you know Paul never got married? Did you know he never had kids? You know he never had family. Do you know that he never had a monument built to him at, in his lifetime and the whatever's built to him now is, doesn't bring him honor? He, he, all he knew is that I'm giving up everything. That's why, you know, I'm giving up my own. Da, 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 da. That song, I surrender. But folks, that can't come by an altar call. That can't come by somebody trying to talk you into that. That comes one way. Your heart screams out like Levi, we are on your side. To whatever degree, we will be with you, Lord. We'll give that up so that you get what you want. And that, oh, oh, by the way, and that be a beautiful thing. Can I say it again? And that be a beautiful thing. Don't do it if it's not in your heart. Don't, don't let anybody coerce you into it. It's not your calling then. You're not a Levite, but it was in Paul. And, and, and I don't want it in me because I read it here and go, oh, wouldn't that be lovely? The heart of David is still crying out. It's crying out in me saying, Give God what he wants. Live toward his end. Awaken the temple to their place. To allow Christ to live in us. So what I'm talking about here, folks, is more than just consecrated men, okay, that, that, are, you know, that are working for God. Do you understand what I just said? I'm not talking about consecrated men 
that are working for God. I'm talking about the very heart of these men had been captured and joined to the Lord on an intimate level. Their heart was captured. They couldn't do anything else. I must be about my father's business. You, you, people can, you know, the rest of Israel can do whatever they want to do. And they'll get off. And they'll worship stuff that's not what's supposed to be worshipped. But you can't do that. And when the call goes out, who is on the Lord's side, it's not a prideful thing. It's a humble, it's a brokenness thing. It's a thing that says, I can't but live this way. I can't but do this. This is what I must do. Why? 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 My heart is captured. I'm captured. I'm captured. You know, when, when I went to Berean and heard the message of Christ and him crucified as a Bible school student, I remember thinking, I can't get too close to this or it's going to rob me of everything. I thought that. I thought that. So what I thought was, I'm going to get this and then I'm going to leave while I still, you know, I'll get it. It got me. It got me. And it really got me because I have spent the rest of my life crying out that Jesus would get the habitation of us that he wants. I think the Levites had found the inner longings of the Lord and they just, you know, it just, they just set themselves daily. You know, I mean, it was real. It was real. It wasn't a sermon. Don't you just hate sermons? I do, and I have to preach them. I hate them. But I love reality. I love the heart of God. I love seeing the Lord. And, and to find those inner longings, what are you going to do? My God, if he opens his heart, if he opens himself like that, what are you going to do? You just go, oh, my Lord, you know. You just set yourself to his end. You just dedicate your life to that. I, I should have had you keep your place there in Numbers chapter 1. Let's go back there real quick. And this is a, a pretty cool thing here as they begin to be drawn in by the Lord. I read it, but maybe you didn't catch it. Uh, Numbers 1 and verse uh, 49. Because this oneness with the Lord had become so complete that Israel wasn't even numbered. Though, though the rest of Israel was, they weren't numbered. Verse 49. Only thou shalt not number the tribe of Levi, neither take the sum of them among the children of Israel. Do you... Keep your place here, but it, a scripture comes to my mind that is just wonderful. Uh, it's over in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And, and I mean, I, I just have to read it because the words aren't going to be enough. Okay, I want... I'd like for you, if you have your Bible, to read, not out loud, but to yourself, read verse 17. Everybody read it? This is 1 Corinthians 6, 17. Okay. Now let me read it. You ready? He that is Levite unto the Lord is one spirit. He that is joined. The word join in Levi is the same word. He that is Levi to the Lord is one spirit. He that is a Levite is one with the Lord. He that is a Levite is joined in the same spirit. Folks, it doesn't hold the same doctrine. 
A lot of people can hold the doctrine. Anybody can dig, anybody can read a book. Anybody can read Watchman Nee. Anybody can read T. Austin Sparks and go, oh, I really like that. It's not about liking that. It's not about liking the doctrine. It's not about joining uh, in the doctrinal thing. It's about one spirit, and that spirit is the Lord, and you have to be Levi to him. You have to be joined as a Levi to him. Now, you know, later on, the Levites were numbered separately, but they, uh, they were not considered among the tribes. They were numbered to find out how many there were to divide them for the work they were called to. But they weren't numbered among the tribes. They didn't get an inheritance in this earth. Well, why, how come you don't have, you know, you know, Mallory, how come you don't own your own house and all this stuff? Why don't you have this and that? You know, Robert, why don't, why don't you have this and that? Is, you know, the Lord is my portion. Oh. Folks, to those that it is, they don't mind. The only people that are resisting it are not Levites. They're the only ones that don't like the thought of it. Well, I, here's what I say. Go Fill your mouth with quail. Fill up. God will send you plenty. God will fill your belly until it's coming out your nose. You'll be, you'll be so happy to get, to get all of that. But Levi is not going to do that. The tribe of Levi, the Levites are not going to do that because their very name. Who are you? I'm joined. <laughs> do you see what I mean? I mean... If you're of the tribe of Levites, if you're of the Levitical priesthood, I'm joined. I'm of the joined priesthood. I'm not the working priesthood, not the ministering priesthood, the joined priesthood. Hallelujah. And so uh, let's go to Numbers 18. Numbers uh, 18, and let's, let's start at verse uh, 2. And, and thy brethren also of the tribe of Levi, the tribe of thy father, bring thou with thee that they may be joined unto thee. He's, this is God talking to the high priest. We're the fulfillment of this. The tribe of Levi, bring thou with thee that they may be joined unto thee and minister unto thee. But thou and thy sons with thee shall minister before the tabernacle of witness. And they shall keep thy charge. This is saying that the Levites are going to keep Jesus' charge. The high priest's charge. Do you, we're the fulfillment. Folks, this is the real... Okay? And they shall keep Jesus' charge and the charge of all the habitation, only they shall not come near the vessels of the sanctuary and the altar, that, they, uh, that neither they nor ye also die, and they shall be joined unto thee. They shall be Levite unto thee and keep the charge of the tabernacle of the congregation for all of the service of the tabernacle, and a stranger shall not come near unto you. And let's, let's drop down to verse 6. And I, behold, I have taken your brethren, the Levites, from among the children of Israel. To you they are given as a gift for the Lord to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. And then let's drop all the way down to verse 21. Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tent in Israel for an inheritance for their service which they serve even under the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. These are the ones that had been assigned the innermost needs of the Lord. The things of his heart and all the things that belonged to it. They were to bear it. 
If they were to bear it and the responsibility for it, listen to me. These are the joined ones. They are the ones who must live to see that God gets a tabernacle, a, a temple, a habitation, no matter where they go, no matter where the people of God are. They have to bear it. They bear the responsibility of it wherever they go. Wherever they go. And I should have told you to keep your place there, but just a few chapters back, chapter 1, verse 50, we're starting, to, we'll get close to closing with this. Uh, numbers 1, but this is really uh, special. Let me, before we do Numbers 1, let's do Numbers 2 and verse 2. This will be good. This is talking about the, all the tribes in verse, Numbers 2, verse 2, all the tribes. Every man of the children of Israel shall encamp by his own standard. They all have their own standard. Anybody get that? They all got their own standard, but God, the Levites don't have their own standard. We'll see that in just a second. God is their standard. God is their banner. The Lord is their banner. Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner. Anyway, every man of, shall encamp by his own standard with the banner of their father's house over against the tabernacle of the congregation shall they encamp. All right, that's where they are. They're all around the habitation of God, the tabernacle. All right, but look at verse 50 of Numbers uh, chapter 1. This is talking to the Levites. But thou shalt appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of testimony and over all the vessels thereof and over all the things that belong to it. They shall bear the tabernacle and all the vessels thereof and they shall minister unto it and they shall encamp round about the tabernacle. And if you've ever seen a picture of that, they are all around the tabernacle. Everybody else has got their own place over here. They've got their own standard to live by. They've got their own special, special. They've got a special place. Here is the banner of so-and-so. What tribe this is. Here is our banner. This is what we stand for. The banner for, for the tribe of Levi, the priests, was the Shekinah glory. And they camped around the tabernacle. Their abode their abode was around the habitation of God. They weren't given that special place. They weren't given to that. In fact, chapter, chapter 2, verse 17, just over a little bit here, says, Then the tabernacle of the congregation shall set forward with the camp of the Levites in the midst of the camp. Who was in the midst of the camp all, at all time? God. Jesus was in the center of everything. Can I get an amen? The Shekinah glory was in the midst. This says so were the Levites. They would encamp about them, and they were specially set off, separated, off from the rest by God. They were made close. In fact, somewhere in my notes I put They would see that God got his habitation. They were to bear that habitation. And I, they were to bear that habitation until the habitation became permanent. Folks, the permanent habitation of God is you and me. The permanent place where I no longer live, but Christ lives, is not in Paul. I know he quoted it. But it's in the Levites. It's in the ones who are joined. It's those who are the fulfillment of what the scriptures are saying here. And when, it, when the time came that that habitation became permanent, the truth is they became that habitation. They became the fulfillment of that in a, in a shadow way of being the fullness of what a habitation was supposed to be those who had no other desires but God's desire, those who would live for no other purpose but God. The, you know, in most churches, this would be an honorable thing. Let's just live for God. Yeah! 
in the halls of heaven, the halls of glory, it's glorious. The angels live for nothing else but God. The saints that have gone before live for nothing else but God. And the few on the planet that do that, they're up there going, yeah! Let me just, I'm just going to read some quick notes. If the Levites were not there at the disposal of God, there would be wrath on the rest of the people. If they weren't close, right there, God would bring wrath on the rest of them. God wanted them close. To not have them close to him that were in tune with his heart was a danger to the rest who knew little about working toward bringing about the things that were foremost to him. The Levites were so given to the intimate things of God's heart that in verse 6 they were assigned to minister to the high priest himself while everyone else received the ministry of the high priest. <laughs> I'm going to end with this. You know, I, I realize more and more that if we don't know the Bible, we're not going to know the heart of the Lord. Okay. I also realize more and more, if you don't know the Bible, most of what I'm saying is going to sound strange. So I'm going to back all the way up here in punt. <laughs> I'm going to back up and punt. Forget everything I just said. It's time to get in the Word of God, folks. It's time to get in the Word of God. It's time to know the book. If we don't know the book, it doesn't matter what anybody says. Somebody can take one scripture, isolate it out, and tell you that's what it's all about. It's time to know the book, upwards and backwards and downward and all around to know the book so that God the Holy Spirit can bear.